I can't believe I've made it this far. I mean, really, Sheila, I just, I can't believe I've made it this far. I'm so grateful to God. Do you know what I think about whenever I see you? I think there was another in the fire. That's what I always think. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fire that was gonna take them out. There was no shadow of a doubt. Even the guards had thrown the men were killed. But there was another in the fire that Jesus was present. I was trying to work out how long you and I have been friends, and we go way back. Way <laughs> back. You were thinking that we met in England first, but my memory um, is that it was actually in Holland. There was a festival called Flavofest, and sometime in the 80s, the 19, that was the 1980s, not the 1880s. <laughs> in the 80s, um, I was with my band, and you were speaking. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I had short, spiky hair. Oh, short, spiky hair and a black leather jacket. I think it was studded. <laughs> but you didn't have a collar around your neck with studs. No, not that much. But, <laughs> but I thought, OK, this is, this is, this different. is, this is different. <laughs> but you were as beautiful as you always were. You had on a beautiful silk blouse and a scarf. And you looked like, I, like I just knew if my mom was there, she'd be like, now, why are you not dressing dressed like, like Johnny? Yes. But even though we looked like we came from different worlds, the minute I met you, I thought, no, mm -hmm. we are yes. sisters. Yes, because you love Jesus, Sheila. You love him with a passion. And even though you had a black leather jacket on and spiky hair, you could see your heart. And mm -hmm. I think that's what drew me to you because of your love for the Savior and your love for the Word. Mm -hmm. You had been to seminary by that time, I think, and had a desire for missions. And, oh, that's what kind of made our hearts resonate with one another. Yeah. And over the years, I would, you know, we've spoken at the same events together. Mm -hmm. I've had the privilege of talking to some of your people. And, and every time I'm with you, I come away with this sense that I always feel there's something that you understand at depth that mm. I don't. Mm. And I think one of the things that's hard is I think that that was a hard won understanding. And that's mm. kind of what your new book, The Practice of the Presence of Jesus, yeah. speaks to. Yes. What read, led you to write this book at this time? Oh, uh, well, uh, back in COVID, uh, in the 2020s, all of us were pretty much sequestered away in our living rooms and and reading things off our bookshelf. And, and uh, I did that. I, I pulled out my old tattered high school copy of uh, Brother Lawrence's The Practice of the Presence of God. Um, he was a uh, Benedictine monk in the 1600s. Yeah. Um, he had been raised in a poor uh, peasant family in France, uh, had fought in the Thirty Years' War in Europe, and had become disabled, crawled his way to a monastery. Uh, the brothers welcomed him in, where he opened up his heart to mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus. And of course, being the first monk there, and amongst all those who had been there for a while, he was uh, assigned kitchen duty and scrubbing pots and pans and the latrine and the floors. But it was in those menial tasks where he found such delight in the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. and. It hit me when I read this back in high school. Really? And I thought, you know, I'm going to reread this uh, in COVID and see what this has to say to me. And as I read it, uh, Brother Lawrence's love for the Lord during the most ordinary everyday tasks, I thought, this is me. This is, this is the way I live. Wow. And so when we came out of COVID, I reflected on that and thought, I'd like to write a book called The Practice of the Presence of Jesus. Because as you said, it's been a it's been hard won. Mm -hmm. My confidence and my love and my joy for my Savior. Um, there has been no no easy moment, as it were, and yet I have such joy in Him. And I just wanted to write about that mm -hmm. so that other people in their hardships might um, come to understand the sweetness of the Savior. As I was. Reading um, the intro to the book, which was written by um, a friend who's been an editor when you were with Zonda and written by John Sloan, I found myself wondering, tell me what your life was like before the accident. What do you remember of who you were back then and what you loved and what you were excited about? I don't know, but I was the least likely candidate to enjoy life in a wheelchair. 
I was athletic on the go. Uh, my family back in the 50s uh, and early 60s, we would hike, do a lot of hiking, canoeing, uh, tent camping on the beaches of, of uh, Delaware uh, on the eastern part of the United States. And just, we were outdoors people. My mother and I, we loved to play tennis. And then all of a sudden to bang, mm. all that ends. Life let, is different. Let me read something. That This is actually from the foreword. Um, remember, this is the 60s, a time, you know, when America was going through a kind of permissive time. But I just want to read this to you. And this is from the intro. It says, um, the late 1960s ushered in the sexual revolution and Johnny fell under its influence. During her remaining school years, she lapsed into, lapsed into moral failures that became habitual and dragged her downward into a deep spiritual depression. She longed to follow Christ, but with each sinful and irresponsible choice, she found herself enslaved. Johnny wanted to repent, but lost the ability to resist temptation. It crushed her to realize that she had become a hypocrite confessing Jesus in the light and denying him in the dark. Weeks before her high school graduation, knowing that her lifestyle would only get worse on a college campus away from home, Johnny prayed an ominous prayer. She boldly pleaded for God to do whatever, absolutely anything to rescue her from her enslavement to lust. Shortly afterwards, she broke her neck. I couldn't read beyond that when wow. I was reading it. That wow. impacted me so greatly. Well, I don't often tell the story. No. I, I assume a lot of people pass over an introduction and get right to the bulk of a book. But uh, yeah, I was, um, I had claimed Christ as my savior, was going to Bible studies, was uh, going to church and showing up in all the right places but I ended up in the wrong places as well. Sure. And that was with my boyfriend in his back seat every Friday night, Saturday night, and uh, getting up on Sunday morning, going to church, confessing all those sins. Oh, Jesus, please, I know that was so wrong. I'll never do that again. And then by the time the week wore on to Friday night, there I was again in, in the back seat of his car. And uh, you're right, I was going off to college. I knew it would only get worse. Yet I know Jesus was true. Mm -hmm. And yet I, I was sick and tired of the way I had been shaming his name and staining his good reputation. And I didn't want to be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was literally enslaved to sin. I had put myself back under um, those temptations and because I had gotten to the habit of, of habitually sinning, I had lost the ability to just snap my fingers. Okay, Holy Spirit, come help me. And um, no help. But I wonder how many of us have prayed prayers that in retrospect, we're so grateful God didn't answer. Yeah. I remember when I ended up in a psychiatric hospital asking that God would take my life. Mm. Um, oh. Yeah, and he didn't. But you prayed that prayer and then suddenly this devastating yes. accident was it a diving accident, for those who might not understand? Right. I, uh, I was heading off to college. I remembered that prayer, and I thought perhaps in college I would meet some wonderful Christian guy, or mm. maybe a campus crusade for Christ would come and rescue me. Or... But anyway, it, it was summertime. Uh, my sister Kathy and I went to the beach for a sisterly get-together before she headed off to her college and I headed off to mine. And... Uh, she laid out the towels on the beach. I splashed into the water and swam out to this raft that was about 50 yards offshore and, and um, saw kids jumping and diving off of it. And I, 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 I took a very reckless dive. I took an inward pike dive off of a raft into what I thought probably wasn't really deep water, but I didn't realize how shallow it was. Uh, the sandbar must have shifted, and immediately when I broke the water, in seconds I just hit, I hit the sandy bottom, and it snapped my head back and crushed my fourth cervical vertebrae and severed my spinal cord. I didn't know that. I was just face down in the water, paralyzed, unable to move, hoping that my sister Kathy had noticed I hadn't surfaced from my dive, but her back was turned to me, and. 
I remembered that before I took the dive off the raft. She was heading back toward the beach towels and her back was turned to me. And at that instant, a crab bit her toe. And it so startled her that she quick whirled around in the corner to scream to me, whirled around and screamed to me to, Johnny, watch out for crabs. And when she did, she saw my, my blonde hair floating on the surface of the water, which Sheila was so odd because just the night before I had peroxided my hair midnight, nice and easy midnight summer blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the shock of blonde hair she noticed, the crab had bit her toe. She realized something awful had happened when she called me, I didn't raise my head. So she, um, just as I started to drown and take in water, she rescued me. And I, I, my first realization that something awful had happened was when I saw my arm slung over my sister's shoulder and yet I couldn't feel it. It was like somebody had dismembered my arm. Uh, the, the, the strange things that happen when you no longer uh, can feel but are paralyzed. So they rushed me to a hospital, ripped off my swimsuit. The doctor said, um, you're never gonna walk again. You've broken your neck. X-rays look pretty bad. Um, where's your mother? She's gotta sign papers. And my sister was frantic, scrambling to get to the phone. Where are my parents? Um, we finally found them and the family gathered and that's when the doctor said she'll, she can't use her hands either. So um, I'm without use of my hands or my leg. And that was 57 years ago. And I, I can't believe I've made it this far. I mean, really, Sheila, I just, I can't believe I've made it this far. I'm so grateful to God. Do you know what I think about whenever I see you? Whenever I watch your little things on Instagram, and if you don't follow Johnny on Instagram, you need to, because you'll get encouraged every time you see her. Every time I listen to you, every time I read things from you, I think there was another in the fire. That's what I always think. Oh. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego yeah. in that fire that was going to mm. take them out. There was no shadow of mm. a doubt. Even the guards had thrown them in were killed. Yeah. But there was another in the fire that Jesus was yeah. present. And that's what I think. Every time I see you, I think Jesus is so present with you. And that's why this book, The Practice of the Presence of Jesus, makes sense. Yeah. And I'm wondering, was there a point you can identify where you suddenly thought, okay, I can't change any of this, but I'm going to find purpose in my life? Yeah. I wasn't... I, I didn't know how to look for purpose. But thankfully, there were others who envisioned it for me when I was too weak to envision it for myself. Good Christian friends who wouldn't let me uh, stay in bed with the drapes closed and the lights out and the air conditioner on and don't come in. I don't want to see anybody, please. And they, they, they uh, invaded that dark space and, and uh, helped me out of that bedroom and envisioned purpose for my life. And, so I, I kind of followed in their tracks and, and my one friend noticed, well, she didn't notice, she, she knew I had an artistic talent. When I was in rehab, they had taught me to write and draw and paint with my mouth. And I, I hated it because only handicapped people do that. Not people like me. I'm gonna get healed. I know I'm gonna get healed. Why do that stuff? It's demeaning. And that was my attitude. Yeah. But um, thankfully, uh, well, I got to a point where I really had nothing else to do and I didn't want to watch soap operas. And so my girlfriend said, why don't you try art? I, I know you can draw. And so um, she set up an art easel on the table and I began drawing and painting. And <laughs> this is such a long story, but real quick, in 60 seconds. In 60 <laughs> Take seconds. as long as you need. Here it is, 60 <laughs> seconds. Um, I did some artwork. There was a show, an art show in the inner harbor of Baltimore City. And the NBC crew, local crew came and were just taking images of everybody. They landed on me, did a quick interview. It ended up on whatever, Good Morning Baltimore. And then uh, NBC producers saw that up in New York. They said, please come to New York and be interviewed by Barbara Walters. On I the didn't Today know show. that. Oh yeah, Barbara Walters on the Today Show. I made her cry, but there was a publisher who was watching the interview in which I said, Jesus Christ makes all the difference in my life. And, and he saw that and he thought, this girl needs to write a story. So he sent me a letter, would you write a book? He sent an author, a co-author. All this to say the book was published and 
and it became an immediate bestseller. And suddenly I'm not on the farm in Maryland anymore. I'm in Los Angeles um, doing a movie about my life. And Billy Graham invites me to be on crusades and, and around the world and Hungary and Russia. And, and it all happened in a blink of an eye. Did I say that in 60 seconds? I think you did in about 58. So. That was actually <laughs> excellent. But you said something um, before you said, well, let's handicap people do that. That's not me because yeah. I'm going to be healed. healed. Let's talk about that. Did you believe that you were going to be supernaturally healed or did you believe that they were going to find something that they could do to repair your spine? Oh, I, I would take either one. <laughs> sure. Supernatural sure. surgery, doesn't matter. And I, I could not understand why God wouldn't heal me. I mean, Psalm 84, verse 11, no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. And I kind of got my life in order and I was, you know, walking according to the word. And, and then other places where uh, uh, Jeremiah, um, I think it's chapter 32, where God says, I will do good to them, his people, with all my heart and soul. God wants to do good. No good thing will he withhold. What one of you who asks for bread will be given a stone. Mm -hmm. uh, your heavenly father gives only good gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the father of light. So good, good, good. Well, walking is good. Mm -hmm. Having use of your hands is good. So it made sense. Why wouldn't God heal me? And if he didn't heal me, then his idea of good must be very different than mine. And so I went to faith healers, Catherine Coleman, local faith healers. I went to churches where I was anointed with oil and prayed over. Someone would grab my hands, arise and walk. And I would do all I could to get up and nothing happened. But Rather than discourage me, I went back into the Bible and I just dug a little bit deeper. And in, in the Bible, I began to understand God's idea for good. Hmm. And that is that I might have courage and I might prize things like patience and perseverance and endurance and self-control that I might cling to Jesus. I read in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 where Paul says, my brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed about the troubles that we endured in Asia. We were in far beyond what we could endure and we despaired even of our lives. And I read that and I thought, yeah, that's me. That's me, I'm despairing of my life. I don't like being paralyzed. And then in the next verse, 2 Corinthians 1, 9, he says, but these things happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Hmm. And so for 57 years, I've been relying on God. And I've got that patience. I've got that perseverance, praise the Lord. I've got the courage. It doesn't come from me, does it, Sheila? It's, hmm. It comes from the Lord Jesus, without whom I'd be nothing. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be burnt toast. I, 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 I'd be gone in a nanosecond. I would have drowned in that water, but uh, he's been so generous. And, and the greatest tragedy of my life, breaking my neck, uh, ultimately became God's greatest use of my life. And I, I still am amazed. Mm -hmm. I still can't believe it. I'm so grateful that I have the chance to, to know him and enjoy him and need him desperately, which is, of course, the key to all that patience, perseverance, and whatever else. Tell us about Johnny and friends. What, what was the genesis of that? Because obviously you determined mm -hmm. that you were going to turn your eyes yeah, outward yeah. and see other people. It almost was as if Christ washed your eyes a second time yeah. and people were no longer trees you yeah. saw clearly. Oh, my goodness. Well, there was a time when I was first injured that I couldn't stand to be around anybody else in a wheelchair. Mm. You know, I'm not handicapped, that's not me. I'm not like those, quote, those people. And um, it's not so much that I did not like those people, it's just that they reminded me of my own uh, limitations and weaknesses and paralysis. And, and I just couldn't, I couldn't bear to face the reality of what I was going through. And, 
But then when came that transformation, you know, when I began to understand God's idea of good, and when I slowly began to see that, that I could trust him as I leaned on him, I began thinking about, quote, those people, the people with disabilities. And, and then I realized I'm, I'm being changed by God. But all these other people in, in the rehab center that I see when I go back there for a medical checkup, they're so depressed. They're still despairing. What can I say? What can I do to help them find what I have discovered? And of course, then, Sheila, when I went uh, to the Philippines in 1989, for the first time, I saw what disabled people really live like mm. in developing nations, crawling through dirt. Um, they don't have wheelchairs, so they crawl through the mud to get here and there. And I, I remember coming home on the plane from the Philippines thinking, God, if I can do anything in their lives to make it better, I'm all in. <laughs> I am all in. And so I moved from our farm in Maryland and uh, started this ministry called Johnny and Friends. And we're 45 years. We've delivered hundreds of thousands of wheelchairs and Bibles. And, and uh, we hold retreats for families struggling with disability here in the U.S. and around the world. And I think that's the answer to that prayer that I prayed after I got out of the back seat of my boyfriend's car. God, do something in my life to change it. And and this is the answer to that prayer. God, you're so amazing. Thank you for rescuing me, saving me, and bringing me through that depression. And, and I get to share your love with these people. Oh. So Johnny and Friends is that. It's the genesis of it was my own desire to help other people with disabilities discover hmm. how awesome God is from a wheelchair. Did you think that you would ever get married? No, um, I was, I was kind of busy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this whole thing with Johnny and friends really, really required a lot of attention, a lot of time, a lot of travel. And I was enjoying being used of the Lord, uh, writing books and else. else. So, uh, no, I, I didn't really think I would marry. So how did you meet Ken? Cause we just, Oh, I've I told you, have I told you this story? Surely I've told you. Surely you have heard this story. I don't, I don't know if you have, but if you have, then bear with me one more time. Sheila's asking the question. So I was sitting in church one morning in my early, I was in my early 30s, and I was bored with the sermon. People always say, oh, so your pastor, no, was a visiting pastor, and he was <laughs> boring, and, I, and yet it was Sunday morning. I didn't want to sit there and just daydream about what I'd have for lunch, and so I thought I should do something honoring to God. So I'll start praying. And I prayed for the people around me. And my eyes landed on the back of this man sitting about oh, five pews in front of me. And I felt strangely compelled to pray for him. I've never heard this story. Oh, surely you no, have. No, I have not. Okay, so let me tell it. <laughs> so I didn't see his face, couldn't tell if he had a wedding ring, didn't know if he was handsome or not, didn't know his name, I just saw, saw a shock of black hair. And I felt compelled to pray. God, if that man doesn't know Jesus, may something in this sermon grab his heart and may he come to know you today. But if he doesn't know you, or if he does know you, then Jesus, get him into your word. If there's conflicts at work, Father, resolve them. Uh, if he's married, uh, strengthen their marriage. Mean, I'm going on and on and praying for this guy in a strange way in which I felt compelled. And I almost wheeled up to him after the service was over to, you know, to say, Guess what I did? I prayed for you, but I, I'm not going to do that. It looks kind of pushy. So I let it drop. And um, we happened to be introduced to mutual friends about a month later. And I, first thing I said to Ken Tata was, turn around and let me see the back, back of your, your head. head. <laughs> and it was him. I said, I know you. I prayed for the back of your head. And it started an interesting conversation. And, and um, then he asked me out on a date. And it was I was so frightened of that because I hadn't dated in decades. And I didn't trust myself. I'd, I, I'd kind of messed up the last time I had dated. I don't know if I want to get myself back in that kind of a situation. But he was so kind and so fun. And um, yeah, so the first date went great. How long have you guys been married now? We've been married 42 years. 
Wow. But it hasn't always been easy. Uh, my disability has made it tough. And, uh, oh, I remember one time shortly after we married, uh, maybe about a year or so, um, he sat slump-shouldered on the edge of the bed and confessed to me, I, I can't do this. I am so tired. Mm. I feel trapped. Oh, gosh. And uh, that my response? Heartbreaking. Well, you feel trapped. <laughs> what about me? You think you're trapped. I'm the one who should feel trapped. Yeah, let me tell you how trapped it is to feel trapped. I mean, oh, it was awful. And it was just, oh, the wrong thing to say. And so shortly after that, we started afresh and new. We're going to start reading the word together. We're going to start praying together, memorizing scripture together. That was 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, the same thing happened maybe about four or five, six years later. And, you know, he again sat on the edge of the bed. Johnny, I, I am, I'm worn out. I can't do this anymore. I'm feel trapped. And I said, this time, sweetheart, I don't blame you one bit. If I were in your position, I'd feel trapped. You, you have every right to feel trapped. Mm. But we're going to get through this. I'm going to be your best cheerleader. I'm going to do everything I can to make it easy for you. So just by reading the word, mm. memorizing, Shifting plugging everything. ourselves into grace, it, mm -hmm. it, it made such a difference. Wow. So we're still saying that uh, we're going to get through this, aren't we? Yes, we will. Yeah, Ken, Ken is darling. We love your husband. He's such a darling. He's a darling. wonderful man. He is. Um, what do you say to young people who struggle with the idea of suffering? Surely if God is good, and God is loving, mm. and God is powerful. Yeah. Why does life have to be hard? Oh, uh, gee, I, mm. well, I do know that Jesus came to save us from the suffering of hell, mm. but he did not come to save us from suffering on earth. Um, if we're going to follow Jesus Christ, we're going to have to take that same difficult, rocky, hard road, blood-stained road down to Calvary where we are going to learn to die to self and live to Jesus. None of us wants to do that. Mm -hmm. None of us feels naturally inclined to go to the cross. Um, we avoid it. We, when it comes to suffering, we'll drug it. We'll escape it. Um, we'll medicate it, divorce it, do anything, but actually learn how to live with it. And so uh, to help us down that road to the cross, mm -hmm. which, of course, uh, First Corinthians says is the power of God. There's power there at the cross, isn't there? To give us help to go, go down that blood-stained hard road, God gives us, um, I like to call it a sheepdog. <laughs> snarling and snapping in our heels, suffering as a sheepdog that drives us down the road to Calvary where otherwise we would not normally go. And so um, God's purpose in suffering is, I mentioned it before from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. It's never glamorous. Mm -hmm. It's messy. It's inconvenient, it's ugly, it's not fun, but then again, then again, the cross was messy, inconvenient, not very glamorous, and no fun at all. But if we want to be like Jesus, I want to be like you, Jesus. Well, um, that will mean we become like him in his death. And that says, it tells us that in Philippians chapter 3, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If we want to be like him, and the understand the fellowship from sharing in his sufferings and, and uh, the power of the resurrection. You've got to be like him in his death, yeah. which means dying to the sins that he died for on his cross. So you die to complaining, you die to sniveling, you die to snippiness, snarkiness, you die to um, getting things your own way, the itchiness to get things your own way, the hog in the spotlight, just all kinds of things. You die to them all. Um, and you're more free to live to Jesus. But you know this, Sheila, don't you? Well, yeah, but I think you understand it, though, at the depth. Because I don't know if you remember saying this to me once, but I was speaking at one of your 
conferences for your supporters. Mm -hmm. And we were having a conversation afterwards. And you said that you felt like in some ways um, that my own, because we're all handicapped in some yes, way. Yes, we are. But you said that you felt that mine was more challenging because you can never forget that you are handicapped, whereas I can forget. You've no idea how that stayed with me. Mm. I mean, I, I, I thought about mm. that. I meditated on it. I prayed about it. And yeah, as in fact, during COVID was a really challenging time for me. I found myself spiraling again into a deep depression, seeing what was happening in the world. And yeah. I remember seeing the Holy Spirit one morning. I don't know how to live in these days. I knew how to live before when, you know, we'd be traveling and speaking and mm. doing and being in church and being with friends. But just it was just Barry and I at home. And I was like, I don't know how to do this. And I remembered um, something that, that Ruth Graham had said to me at one point to read. And she said, don't just read what's current. Read as far back as you oh, can. Yes. Because our brothers and sisters have left a roadmap. And I, I read this thing. What he, he lived in the fourth century. And he had said that whereas most of scripture is written, speaks to us, the Psalms speak for us. Mm. And that they give us a language of prayer. And that's one of the things that began to help me. I began to read mm. the Psalms out loud and to speak them oh, out loud. God. And there's something so good about your ears hearing yes. what, your, um, what your eyes are, are reading that brings, and you're stating what's true. This is yes, what's true, yes. no matter what I feel. If you're just joining us, if you just tuned in, you'll need to go back and watch the rest because today I'm here with Johnny Erickson Tara and we're talking about, um, she's got a great new book out called The Practice of the Presence of Jesus, daily meditations mm. on the nearness of our Savior. So I wanted to ask you, for somebody who's sitting at home right now and they're thinking, I can tell that this is your life. How do I even begin to practice the presence of Jesus? What mm. do I do? Well, uh, I would suggest waking up tomorrow morning and if your back aches and you're stiff and you can't get out of bed and you're thinking about all the appointments and uh, there's, you know, just too much, too much to do in the day and you just want to pull the covers over your head, then uh, don't be ashamed of that. Just say, Jesus, I can't do this day. I cannot. I don't even know how I'm going to make it to 12 noon and lunchtime. I hurt so much. There's too much on my plate. I'm bewildered as to what to do to make things better in my household. Whatever it is, just say, to tell Jesus that you need him and you need him desperately. And then I will tell you by um, 7.30 in the morning when you finally do get out of bed or eight o'clock, God will have given you grace. Um, it's the way I wake up every morning. I mean, I've been disabled now, as I said, 57 years. And I, I wake up and, oh, Jesus, I'm so stiff. I don't know if I can do another day of quadriplegia. I'm not cut out for this anymore. I'm getting older. But I can do all things through you as you strengthen me. I have no strength, but you do, Jesus. I have no hope for the day, but you do, Jesus. And, and it's that constant reliance. That's a good way to start practicing mm -hmm. his presence. And you mentioned it a moment ago, the Psalms. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken and I, we, we've memorized so much together, but um, you know, it's wonderful to wheel out the front door. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord God Almighty. You know, just, just to rehearse the Psalms as part of your mm -hmm. language to God. Um, uh, Ken and I often, when we're in the van together, we quote the scriptures that we've memorized, but our, the one that we most uh, love doing is, um, is Psalm 63, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you, in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Yeah. And just, just speak the word of God into the air and you'll be you know, drilling it into your heart. These, there's all kinds of way to start practicing the presence. Just don't go out the front door on automatic cruise control. No. Do, do not get up tomorrow morning and take a quick shower and scarf down breakfast and do a tip of the hat of a quiet time and then go out the front door and say to God, well, you know what? I, I, I kind of got this Christian thing figured out now. I, I kind of got the lay of the land. I know the ropes. So Jesus, I, I'll take it from here. I had a good quiet time with this morning, but I'll, I'll take it from here. But if anything happens, I'll check in with you. I mean, do not live that way. It's, it's, it, 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 you'll spiral down so quick.
because God resists the proud. Mm -hmm. And the proud are people who just, whether they realize it or not, they just don't need Jesus anymore. And you do need Jesus. Mm -hmm. We all need him. Without him, we can do nothing. So just get into the practice of, of remembering him, recalling him, and memorizing the word will help, right? Yeah. And I love, like, when I first wake up in the morning, even before I let Maggie, our wee dog, out, I, I talk to the Lord because I just want that from the first moment that I'm aware of being awake, you know, I'll just say, good morning, Lord. Good morning. And, and honestly, this stage in my life, he's become my closest, dearest yes. friend where I talk to him about everything oh. and everyone. And I'll walk through the airport and I'll see someone and I'll throw a prayer toward them and I'll yes. ask sometimes, I'll feel prompted by the yes. Holy Spirit and I'll say to someone, do you mind if I pray for you? And so often when it's directed by the Holy Spirit, there'll be this welcome, yes. yes. Almost never have I asked someone if I could pray and that one woman did say no. So I prayed for her as she walked away. But most people are yes. grateful because we live in a world where people are hurting. Yes. And you are practicing the presence of Jesus when you do that. And it's so strengthening to me personally to hear you say that. You know, it just, it just strengthens me. It's like, okay, in Ephesians, it says we are one, you know, it, it, so we're supposed to act like it, but yeah. we are intimately linked. And so when your victory shines, such as they, they did just that in that instant when you shared that story, it just strengthens me. It makes me want to do the same the next time I'm in an airport. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how the way the body of Christ builds each other mm -hmm. up. Thank you for being faithful. He has helped you be faithful for many years. One of the things you do that I think is phenomenal is the summer camps that you have. What have oh. you seen God do for families during oh. those camps? Oh, my goodness. Um, we have families who come to our family retreats. We call them family retreats. And uh, if any of you are interested, if you know a special needs family, you want to tell them about uh, what we have available this year, we'll have uh, 63 family retreats across the U.S. 63? 63. Whoa. Oh, and... Um, I think it's 73 internationally in developing nations. Wow. I'm so excited. And these, these uh, retreats are five days of hands down, slam dunk, off the chart fun and <laughs> fellowship and worship. And, and um, it's wonderful. Well, here, here's an example. Uh, when I was at the last family retreat I was at last summer, and um, I looked for this one couple, uh, Eddie and Kim. I can't remember the last name but they had two sons with autism. And of course, our trained volunteers take care of the children. And, but I never saw Eddie or Kim. They're napping. Uh -huh. They never get a nap. Wow. We love coming to this retreat. It's the only time we can nap wow. and sleep. And I, my heart just breaks to hear that. Oh, what a gift that must be yeah. to them and to know that their children have been taken care of. Yes. And I, I think the strengthening part of family retreat is just what we talked about a, a second ago, that, that they see other moms and dads making it mm -hmm. by, by holding fast to Jesus yeah. and holding on to his word, uh, which is why we think it's so important that we have good camp pastors who mm -hmm. can um, give not only the gospel message of salvation, but also how to live with hardship day by day by day. And so, yeah, I, oh, Sheila, never would I have dreamed Never would I have dreamed that God would use this wheelchair that way. And mm. I'm so honored, so privileged. So, And what, what I'm really excited about is when I go to a family retreat, and uh, it was a Camp Allen, Texas. I was wheeling, Ken and I were wheeling out of the dining room hallway and hall and going outside, and a gaggle of girls came up the path heading into the dining room, and and, and they were talking and jabbering a mile a minute, but I heard one of them say, <laughs> um, who's she? And I heard the other person say, other girl say, I think her name is Joni, and she has something to do with this camp, but I'm really not sure what it is. <laughs> and I went, yes, because, you, you know, you don't want a global ministry to depend on your persona. Yeah. You, you want the programs to be valid enough that they they carry their own weight yeah. and, and nothing requires my presence. So that that's really cool to know that. I want to remind you of a moment, and it was during um, Women of Faith, um, which I was part of for many years, and you were there to speak that night, and there'd been a mix-up in the arena. Oh. Do you remember? I do. There'd been a mix-up in the arena, and I don't know whether they'd sold more tickets than we had seats for, but there were a group of women who came, and we probably had 15,000 women in the arena, 
and they were, it was getting really ugly. They were starting to really complain about the fact that they didn't know where they were gonna sit. I believe it was vocal too, in yes, the arena. Yes, it was very, you very hear vocal. It. <laughs> and do you remember what you did? Oh yeah, it was in Sacramento, yeah. in the Arco Arena, and I wheeled out onto the platform and said, I understand that some of you ladies are not happy that you're standing. Well, I'd be happy to give you my seat if you'd like them, like it, so just come on down and I'll trade places. And everybody then quieted down and the program went on. <laughs> but it was, it was so much more than that. I mean, it wasn't, a, you weren't shaming them. You were simply, context changes yeah, everything. It does. You were some, somehow just saying to them, listen, mm -hmm. you know, I understand this is inconvenient mm -hmm. and don't worry, we're working on it. And we got them seats eventually. But, but here's where I have been sitting for all mm -hmm. these years. And it was truly, it was such a God moment. Yes. It, was, it was beautiful. I mean, we talked about it for weeks afterwards, right. that, that that moment <laughs> turned the whole corner oh, for so absolutely. many of those women. You know, when Ken and I, uh, you mentioned context changes everything. Literally, when Ken and I have a meal together at night, almost always the prayer goes something like, um, oh Lord Jesus, thank you for this food. 99.9% .9 of the world would give their eye teeth to eat like this. And yet we do and they don't. And we are so humbled by that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. you know, it's that idea of contact. Mm -hmm. I had pneumonia last year um, and I was in the hospital for 45 days. And, and um, the whole time my spirits were bright because I'm looking around at all the machines and all the x-ray scans and the CAT scans and the cafeteria ladies coming in with their food trays and the ladies who come and take your blood at 4 a.m. And I'm looking at all this thing, 99.9% .9 of the world would give anything right. to have medical care like that. Yeah. I am so honored and privileged. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's, that's a Christ-like perspective I, I think so on too. things. It's another way of practicing the presence of Jesus. So the next time you're in the hospital, don't be quick to complain but about the food, but remember that most people would love to have that food around the world. But. You know, I read something um, online the other day that I think it's 75%, but it might be more than that, of the world don't have an address. Mm. They live in places oh. where it's just, there's no address. They're just, and, and we've both been to places like yeah. that, that yeah. somehow learning to be, to see with different eyes yeah. and be grateful. Grateful. It's interesting to me that one of the people who's taught me more about gratitude than anyone is, is you. And yet mm. for all these years, mm. you've sat in this. And here's what I think is so ironic. And you can probably explain it to me because I don't understand mm. it. How you can be paralyzed, but you still experience incredible pain. How is that possible? Well, it, uh, it's not the kind of pain that you might feel when you sprain your ankle or break your kneecap. It, it, it's neuropathic pain. Um, Which I would think is probably worse. It, yeah, plus I have arthritis and scoliosis and whatnot, and it, it just, it's just so hard at times. And you mentioned uh, the fire, uh, seeing Christ in the fire. That's one of the metaphors I use at night when I am positioned in one position, and my husband, after I've got the lymphatic sleeve on, my oxygen on, do I have this in place, pillows tucked just right, and it's and I'm like this, and they'll say, are you okay? And I'll say, oh, God, please, Ken, pray my faith not fail when I can make it to 5 a.m. You know, because I, I just don't want to be waking them up every, every hour. And so I try and sleep as long as I can. But sometimes I can't because of pain. And I used to, years ago, in my mind think, oh, darn it. I hate this pain. I wish it weren't like this. Oh, God. You know, I'm just stewing about my pain. But that's exactly what my pain would want it to do. That's exactly what the devil would want me to do about my pain. And so I'm not gonna listen to my pain. I'm not gonna be anxious about it. I'm not gonna be fearful. I'm gonna take a deep breath and quote scripture to my pain. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse eight. Pain, it says there that though I am hard pressed on all sides, and I know you're pressing me hard tonight. The next part of that verse says, I will not be crushed. You cannot crush me, pain. And so I, 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 I enter, then I see myself entering this Nebuchadnezzar-like fiery furnace where the pain is so hot and hard. And I slowly move into it. 
with a smile, breathing deeply, calmly, peacefully, and I expect to see Jesus there. And sure enough, he, he shows up. He shows up and, and takes me through it until he has transformed it into a place of meeting him and hope mm-hmm. and perseverance. And I come out the other side, always so rejuvenated and refreshed because Christ has met me in my pain. And that's a, that's a daily practice I do all the time. Meet me here, Jesus. Right there on that hip. Right there. Oh, meet me right there. And um, again, I can do nothing by myself, but uh, I'd have to rely on him. I've just um, finished writing a book called The Hope of Heaven. And when I was writing it, I couldn't help but think about you. Let's talk about heaven. (laughs) What does heaven mean to you at this stage and place in your life and in your relationship with Jesus? Well, we've talked about perseverance. And, you know, I can't do this, but Christ can do it through me. Day in, day out, one step, one foot, moving forward. And Sheila, I like to imagine on that day when I enter heaven, It'll be like, okay, I'm on the gun lap right now, racing toward that finish line. There's the tape. I could almost see it. And finally, when I break the tape with my chest and I enter heaven, I picture myself as a marathoner dropping to my hands and my knees, heaving, heaving, and feeling the sand of the celestial shore between my fingers. Oh, I made it. God, I made it. And then I'm going to roll over on my back on the sand and just listen to the quiet for a moment and and close my eyes and smile and breathe deeply. And I imagine that I'm gonna feel somebody's shadow over me. And I will open my eyes and it's Jesus. And he'll reach down and pull me up and squeeze me against him. He said, there, there, sweetheart, you're home. (laughs) You're home, sweetheart, it's all behind you. You're home. And that's kind of how I picture it, you know. I've also, Another metaphor, do you mind me saying another metaphor? I have to, since my pneumonia last year, I've got to do chest percussion therapy twice a day. It's where Ken has to wrap this tight Velcro vest around me and and you turn it on, it just rattles you like a jackhammer. It's very loud and noisy. And then you got to put the nebulizer on and that's hissing and wheezing as well. My bedroom's full of all this noise. And uh, it takes 15 minutes in the morning and 15 minutes in the afternoon. And when the time is up, it just goes boom. And I've learned to say, and just like that, it's over. (laughs) And I wonder if when I get to heaven and pass through the gates of pearl, I'll hear all the noise and the dust of earth behind me. And I'll say, just like that, it's over. (laughs) It's just going to be over in such a snap of the minute. So... What we do now with the precious moments God gives us is so critical because we have a chance now with our obedience and our trust in Jesus Christ to enlarge our eternal estate, Mm. to to make more room in heaven for joy and worship and service of him. So don't waste your suffering, right? I would love it if you would take a moment and maybe pray for our audience who are at home who are in a place of real despair and suffering and struggle mm. right now and who have listened mm. and been so moved by mm-hmm. not just not your story, by you. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you would just say a couple of words and maybe pray for our audience. You've heard this lady, this old lady in the wheelchair. I'll be 75 this year, so I qualify as an old lady, but you've heard her and uh, all these scriptures. This smile is not made out of Colgate. It's true, and it's true for you. And so don't waste your suffering. Let it be the thing that tomorrow morning drives you into the arms of your Savior out of desperate need. So let me pray for you. Father God, I'm looking at this camera and thinking that there's some on the other side of it who is just weighted down with their hardship, affliction, arthritis, caring for a disabled child or grandchild, or going through a sad divorce, whatever it is. 
Father God, your heart is so tender toward them. So thank you for offering them Jesus Christ, who not only saves us for all of eternity as we confess our sins, but saves us and rescues us right now mm -hmm. with grace upon grace upon grace. So tomorrow morning, may my friend, our friends watching, Lord Jesus, may they look to you for not only saving grace, oof, but for daily grace to live and live with a smile, trusting that you have determined all things for our good and for your glory. In your name, Jesus, aren't you the best? Amen, amen. If you prayed with Johnny, if we would love to be able to just hear part of your story. We have wonderful prayer partners, just darling men and women who are committed to to praying for you and we just need somebody to listen to you you know sometimes that's one of the greatest gifts we can give one another is to feel seen and, yeah. and listened to and known and so i wanted to read just a few verses to you from second corinthians chapter four um verse seven it's just such a beautiful passage we now have this light shining in our hearts but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure this makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never, never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we're not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. How can our audience connect with you and how can we pray for you? Well, thank you for asking. Well, uh, our friends who are watching can always reach me at johnnyandfriends.org. That's spelled J-O-N-I-A-N-D-F-R-I-E-N-D-S, uh, johnnyandfriends.org. And uh, I would appreciate if friends might pray that I'll live to 76. Mm -hmm. I'm 75 this year. 76, maybe 77, 78. I mean, I, I used to be afraid of going old in a wheelchair, but there's so little time left to tell a hurting world, as you mentioned, the world is hurting right now, about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just would long for my life to be uh, um, just stretched a little bit further so I can just um, tell more people with disabilities, especially uh, about Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. How can I pray for you? Oh, gosh. Um, pray for us here at TBN. Um, Matt and Laurie, their hearts are that we would throw the doors wide open mm. to bring the gospel to as many people as possible. That is our mm. passionate commitment that those who don't know Jesus would hear who Jesus is. And that for those of our friends and family who are part of a team, that they would be encouraged and built up oh, in their faith. Yes. Um, yeah. And that my husband will stop asking for another dog. <laughs> Many more dogs can a person have. <laughs> but Johnny, we, we love you so much. Please tell oh. Ken that we send our love. He's Absolutely. Such a wonderful man. And yep, yep. thank you. Just thank you. Thank Johnny, you, Sheila. The book is called The Practice of the Presence of Jesus. It's a wonderful book. I promise you, every single page will bring you encouragement and draw you closer to the Lord.